Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody? Good. Isn't it a beautiful day? Yes. Yes. What a gorgeous day. Today's message is really important. It's not, it's not that long. But before I start that, I want to remind you all. 22 months ago, I preached a sermon on something that was sweeping across the world called COVID. And I told you that God was beginning to do something and that it was going to affect all of our lives and that it was the beginning of interesting times. So let me ask you, has it been interesting times for the last two years? Yes. <laughs> lots, of, uh, lots of different things have happened, right? Lots of turmoil, lots of whatever. Through it all, I told you, God is in control. Amen. And he's still in control. So I want to tell you now of something happening in the world that you all are... You need to be apprised of, you need to know what's going on in the world. You see, you all and I, we, we have a different perspective on life. We're not supposed to see things simply from the viewpoint that the world gives us. It gives us a viewpoint, and we, we can learn from it. You and I have, uh, we have an additional blessing. We have God's perspective. And we're supposed to be able to put things into God's perspective to see how the th things that are happening in the world are going to impact you and me, your family, and my family. Two of the ranking members of two different of the committees in the U.S. Congress, the House Foreign Intelligence Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee, um, one Democrat, one Republican, have both come out in the last 24 hours and said that there's a very good likelihood that Russia is going to invade the Ukraine. Um, one of the congressmen said, probably within the next 30 days. Now, what has Russia, 7,000 miles away, and the Ukraine, which is next door to Russia, what has that got to do with you and I today in the year 2022? <coughs> in the United States of America. And I want to remind you of something that the great, the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, said. He said, that which has been before will be again. There's nothing new under the sun. What has been before will be again. There's nothing new under the sun. And what was he saying? He was saying, history repeats itself. And I want to take you all back to 1938. In 1938, the whole world was coming out of a Great Depression. They were still in the midst of this Great Depression, but they were starting to finally come out of it a little bit. Uh, the greatest generation had grown up during that time, and they had gone through hard times, dust bowl, and uh, no jobs. And it wasn't only in America, it was around the entire world. And over in Germany, they had just come through World War I, they had been defeated. And um, a crazy guy, I guess I shouldn't call him that, a very shrewd politician by the name of Adolf Hitler came to power. And in 1938, Adolf Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia. Now, here in America, we had our own problems. You know, we were trying to get by, we were trying to feed our families, we were trying just to put food on the table get through, like I said, the Dust Bowl days and, and the hard times and, and what was happening thousands of miles away between Germany and another country called Czechoslovakia, what's that got to do with Americans? Nothing at all. And so most Americans didn't pay attention. But what happened was this dictator in this country invaded this country next door and the leaders of the world, the leaders of the free world, did nothing. Because they were, it was a, a, they were weak. I don't know how else to put it, they were weak. And, and on the continent of Europe, they were kind of shocked because of the militarism of this dictator. And so 
the Prime Minister of England, who was a man named Neville Chamberlain, flew over to Germany to meet with this dictator to find out why he was doing what he was doing. And he came back and he was waving a piece of paper, and you could see newsreels of this, 1938. And he said, we have made peace with the Prime Minister of Germany. There will be peace in our time. See, the, the, uh, the Prime Minister of, of Germany has assured us that, you know, his intentions are peaceful. Eleven months later, World War II broke out. Do you all get the analogy I'm trying to tell you? I am telling you, I do not know what's going on in the world, but that what is going on right now over there between Russia and Ukraine could have worldwide implications. And I think all of you, number one, you need to be aware of this. I know you all have your problems, and I have my problems, and we all have our issues, we all have our things that we're into and whatever. But you need to know what's going on in the world. And you need to know it from a biblical perspective. Now, I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm telling you that God is in control, and He's got everything laid out, but He wants His people always to be aware of what's going on in the world and how it applies to them. And so I'm just giving you that heads up, okay? Please, be watching for the next 30 days or so. Oh, by the way, <coughs> somebody from the British intelligence, this was in the news this morning, somebody from the British intelligence uh, has an inside person in the Russian Prime Minister's inner circle, and they revealed the plans that Vladimir Putin has for the Ukraine. Okay, so intelligence was leaked on what he's planning to do. Hopefully, the Western nations will take appropriate actions, and hopefully by the release of this information, maybe the Prime Minister will back down and will have peace for a while longer. We don't know. We don't know. But I think you all should be aware of that, and I think you should all be praying and asking God for wisdom. Okay? I asked you last week to read the first chapter of James. We're starting the book of James. James is, is a book for people who are going through trials, and it's a book to give us maturity, to, to grow us up as Christians. Again, um, as much as we like babies, love babies, um, babies grow. They're supposed to grow. A little axle back there is, is just a baby, a baby carrier, but he's going to eventually start walking and then talking and, and, and driving mom and dad crazy with questions. Or whatever. <laughs> then he's going to go to school, Lord willing, and he's going to, you know, grow up. In the same way, your father in heaven does not want you to stay spiritual babies. We are to mature. We're to be growing in our faith. And if you've called yourself a Christian for more than five years or ten years, the Father expects you to have learned some things and to continue to grow and to mature in the faith. This is what He expects. And you know what? He is going to grow us up whether we want it to or not. Okay? So that's, that's what James is about. We're going over the epistle of James. I want to remind you all that James wrote to believers who were going through great trials. Do you remember? These were people who, the early church, were Jewish people who believed in the Messiah. Jesus came. He did great miracles. He rose from the dead. At one point, over 500 people saw him after his resurrection. He gave final instructions to his apostles. And then he went back into heaven. He told them to go out and spread the good news. Um, the persecution broke out. And the Jewish leaders started persecuting the believers. Uh, they put Stephen, they stoned Stephen, one of the first deacons. They stoned him to death. And they started rounding up the believers. So the believers were scattered. They, they fled throughout the empire. Okay, so they were going through great trials and tribulations, if you will, and 
their faith was being tested. So James wrote this letter to them. That's the purpose of the epistle of James. To believers who are going through great trials. In chapter 1, from verses 2 through 18, those verses deal with how we respond to trials. James wants us to know some things. And the first thing he wants us to understand is that faith, real, genuine faith, endures these things. If you truly have faith, that means you have faith in God, you're going to trust that God's going to bring you through whatever. Real faith endures. That's the first thing he wants us to, to understand. We're going to see this all over, not just in the book of James. We're going to see it in Paul in Romans. We're going to see it here in the book of Hebrews. It says, you need to what? Persevere. Persevere. The same word, endure. You can use either one, whatever you're comfortable with. Real faith perseveres. Real faith endures. And so we read here in the 10th chapter, you need to endure so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. You need to endure so you know what the will of God is so that having endured, you will receive, third big thing there, something that He's promised, what He's promised you. So you see, you need to find out what God's promised you so that you can endure whatever trials that you go through, whatever temptations that you go through. God uses trials and temptations to develop, to strengthen, to mature our faith. It's a way to bring us to spiritual maturity. That's why we have trials in our life. Okay? It, they're there to mature us. In the fifth verse of chapter 1, Patty and I were talking about this earlier, it's, it reads this way. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously, and it will be given him. And Patty told me that she read, was reading the first chapter of James, and she got to verses 5, 6, and 7, she got sidetracked. I said, why is that? And so we talked about that, because you know, it talks about wisdom, and she, she had some questions about that, so she went and looked up in some commentaries, what they had to say about wisdom, and, and she read different commentaries and had different explanations for this. Okay? How many of you have ever heard that before? Yeah. Go ahead, raise your hands if you've ever heard it. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a very famous verse, quoted a lot. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproaching, and it will be given him. What is wisdom? Yeah, what is wisdom? I'll tell you what, Violet, I'm going to give you a little answer today and a big answer next week. Wisdom is the insight that you gain in life. It's what makes a person make the right decisions Amen. in situations. And you get it, you attain wisdom by different means. The first thing is knowledge, learning. Second is experience, just going through things in life. So in other words, wisdom comes with age. And then the third thing that causes us to, to end up being wise is having the right perspective. But that's next to week's sermon. Okay? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and will be given him. You all, you all heard that now? Yes. If you lack wisdom, you need to ask God? Okay. <clears throat> so we lack wisdom. We need to be wise. We need wisdom. We're to ask God for wisdom. Question. And this is always the question. And this will part, hopefully answer Patty's question. What is the context of that verse that James says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and will give them. Do I lack wisdom? Absolutely. Do I need wisdom? I need wisdom. 
But what was the context? Don't just take a verse from the Bible. Like I said, the Bible is a tapestry, people. I want, you all know what a tapestry is? When somebody explains to somebody else here who doesn't know, what is a tapestry? Anybody? A beautiful picture. Yeah, it's a beautiful picture that is woven by string or some other material. And different colors of string are woven together. And when you step back, you see this beautiful, beautiful picture of something. That's a tapestry. It's woven together of multicolored strings, but together it gives you a picture. And you go, wow, that's really beautiful. But what you and I can't do, and I've told, I've mentioned this over and over and over again, is you can't take one string of that tapestry, pull it out, and hold it up out of context, and just start applying it to yourself or to other people willy-nilly. It, 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 it fits together, people. There's a picture there. And we do that. We sometimes just take something out of context and we pull the string off the ceiling, as it were, that's hanging down, and we, and we give it to somebody and say, here's the answer for you. And you give somebody a cute little Christian proverb, or you give somebody a cute little Christian verse. It may or may not be applicable to that person's situation. But if you kind of think it does, or you hope it does, or you believe it does, well, what you think or hope or believe, what I think or hope or believe, is irrelevant. Is that the scripture the person needs? For their, you know, only God can give you that kind of wisdom. Does that make sense? Everything has to be read in the Bible in context. Don't take things out of context. So we read this verse. Do any of you lack wisdom? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously, and it will be given to him. But what was the context of that? Well, to read in context, we got to go back a few verses and then read it together. And then you'll, hopefully you'll see and you'll go, ah. So let's go back to verse 2. That was verse 5. Let's go back to verse 2. And let's read these verses together to put it in context to see how James got to the point where he said, if you, if you lack wisdom, let him ask God. Verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials. <clears throat> Boy, that's a strange way to start this letter off. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Now, we go back to verse 2, and you notice I've got the word trials underlined. You all see that? Okay, so let me read this again. Consider it all joy, my brothers, or my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the trials... Oh, wait, he didn't say that word again. He used some other words in place of the word trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith knowing that these trials, so these trials are what? Yeah, trials that come to you and I in life are a way to test our faith. Now that word test, I really don't like that word test there. That's, that's, there's a better word. Um, that word testing, the original Greek word, means to prove genuine. Um, you know what I would use? Assay. You all know what an assayer is? Somebody who tests the genuine. Remember that? Somebody who tests the genuine. Somebody brings to an assayer a rock, and it's got some gold in it, and they want it tested if this is real gold or not. Maybe it's fool's gold. I heard pyrite. But it might be real gold. And so he tests it. What's he doing? He's Checking for the genuineness of it. That's that word test. Knowing that the proving of your faith produces what? Endurance. God is proving your faith. He is, he is showing you the genuineness of your faith. And he's doing this because he wants to produce in you and I endurance and perseverance. And let endurance 
have its perfect result. In order that you may be what? Mature. In order that you may be what? Mature. God wants us to grow up. We can't always be little babies. We can't always be little kids. Depend on mommy or daddy. We must grow up. We must mature. God is maturing you. Whether you want him to or not, he is maturing you. Do you all understand that? And one of the ways that he's maturing you, well, always it's this way. You want to grow up? <coughs> Learn everything you can that's in the book. God's wisdom. Number two is he's going to mature you through your experiences in life. He's going to allow trials and temptations in your life to cause you to endure in your trust in Him. You're going to go through a trial, God wants you to learn to lean on Him. Not on yourself, not on your money, not on your own knowledge, not on your own strength and capabilities or anything else. God wants us to learn to depend on, to trust, to rely on Him. So he'll bring trials in order for us to learn to endure in our faith, in our trust. There we get finally get to that verse 5. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, without any doubting. That's the context. That's the context. So, here it is. In other words... I need help going through some trial. I need wisdom to know what's going on. I need wisdom to be able to cope in this trial in my life. You need help going through some trial? You need to figure out what's going on? You need to figure out what God wants you to do in this situation? Then ask God. Then ask God for the wisdom. Ask God to show you to give you insight into what's going on. Ask God to give you wisdom in how to deal with this situation. That's the context of that verse, Patty, in verse 5, where it says, if you lack wisdom, ask God. Yeah, we do lack wisdom. But in the context, it was, if you lack wisdom when you're going through trials, if you're going through trials, God is teaching you to endure in faith. But if you don't understand what's going on, if you need help getting through some trial, getting through some pickle, what do you turn to? What you're supposed to turn to is God. You're supposed to be turning to the Lord saying, Father, I need help. Help me to get out of this pickle. Help me to get through this. Help, show me what's going on. Show me what I need to do or not do. That's wisdom. And God says, if you need wisdom, ask me. I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you generously. And I won't rebuke you for that. But if you ask me for wisdom, don't doubt. Don't doubt what? Don't doubt that I'll give it to you. You need help getting through some trial? Ask me, God says, I'll give you the wisdom to get through it. But don't doubt that I'll give you the wisdom. I'll give it to you. Wow, isn't that? That's phenomenal. If we're to respond correctly when we face a trial, we need to remember three super big, important, eternal truths. Listen to me, all of you. Everybody in here has faced trials in their life, is right now going through a trial in their life, or will go through great trials of all of us. Everybody sitting here. For those of us who are older, can you say yes? Can you say amen? Those of us who are older, we've gone through lots of great trials, or we're going through great trials right now, but we know that we're going to go through more great trials. For you younger people, listen. Mommy and Daddy have taken care of you, and they've sheltered you, and that's great. Thank God you, got, you had Mommy and Daddy to take care of you. But I've got news for you. You're going to experience great trials. All of us are going to experience great trials on us. We're going to lose jobs. We're going to lose family members. People we love are going to die. People who we love are going to turn against us. Um, things are not going to turn. We're going to make great plans and they're going to smash on the ground. These things happen. We all are going to have to go through trials. Yes? 
We all do go through trials. But here are three great truths that I want every single one of you to remember. <clears throat> Number one, no matter what happens in your life, God is sovereign. Is that what it says? King, in control. God is in control of everything, people. Everything. This is a great truth that you need to burn into your hearts and minds and brains. And you need to, no matter what happens in your life, you've got to understand God is totally in control. And if he's totally in control and he can do anything and he can, then if he has allowed that trial to happen in your life, what does it mean? It means he's brought it for a reason. He's allowed it for a reason. Question, if God controls every atom in the entire universe, and he does, if God is in total control, and he is, if God knows everything, and he does, if God controls past, present, and future, and he does, can he not prevent anything from happening? Can he not prevent anything from happening? So if he didn't prevent this great thing happening in your life, then that must mean that he's allowed it. Huh. He's allowed it. He's God. We're not. He knows everything. Number one, never ever forget that God is in control of everything. There's not an atom in the entire universe that spins or doesn't spin, that moves or doesn't move, without the express will of God. He is in total control. And if he's allowed things to spin this way or spin that way or this to happen or that, he's done it for a reason. He has the plan. He's in control. That's no one. Don't ever forget that. God is in control. And number two, which is tied directly to number one, is this. God, in his sovereignty, will prove our faith. He'll test it for us. He'll... He's showing us. He already knows where we're at. It's for our benefit. He's trying to mature us. He's going to prove our faith, and he's going to do it. This is the important number two. He's in control, and he's allowing this. What does that say on the line at the last three words? For what? You have to remember that. You have to learn that, and you have to believe it with everything in your being. God is in control. Don't forget that. He's in control. And number two, he's doing things, everything in your life. He's working for your good. He says that over and over and over again. Not over here in James. He says it everywhere. I, I read it in Hebrews. Let, let me quote to you one of the most famous uh, verses that Paul wrote in the book of Romans 8.28. You all ready? Paul wrote in Romans 8, 28, For God causes all things, all things, to work together for good to those who love him, to those whom he has called. God causes all things to work together for good. God causes all things to work together for good. For who? For those who love him. For those whom he is called. God causes all things to work together for what? For good. So, number one, don't ever forget, God is totally in control of everything. So number two, if your life spins out of control, something bad happens, some trial enters your life, don't freak out. Remember the second great truth. God is in control and he's allowed this because he's working out something good in your life. You may not see now. Now that starts to make sense when James says, consider it all joy when you encounter these various trials. Why? Because God is working something great in your life. God's working on something good in your life. And the third thing that you must never ever forget is that God is faithful for his promises. Number one, he's in control of everything. 
Not one atom spins without his control. Number two, he's totally in control and he's working everything out for your good. Now, by the way, I've, I said it several times, so I'm going to repeat it again. God is working, causing all things to work together for good for those who love him. It doesn't say God's causing everything to work together for good for everybody. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called, who he is called. If somebody spits in the face of God, they want nothing to do with God, hey, as they say, it's no swell on my back, go. Go, laugh at God, mock God, spit in the face of God. That's between you and God. It stinks to be you, but go. But when your life goes to hell in the handbasket, and I guarantee you it will, don't expect God to bring everything together for your good. Because it says, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him. You all get that? He's working for our good. And number three, God has made promises to those who love him. He's made you and me a bunch of promises. What's he promised us? Anybody? Eternal life. Thank you. Has he not promised his eternal life? Yes. Has he not promised to be with us always? Yes. Over and over and over again. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He's promised us eternal life. He's promised us an immortal body. He's promised us an incorruptible body. He's promised us that we're going to eat and drink together with the saints in heaven. That we're going to do some, we're going to experience some things. He says, you can't even imagine what I got planned for you. He's made thousands of promises in the scriptures. And he's <laughs> faithful to all those promises. <laughs> so he's in control. He's working for your good. And he's made some promises. And you hang on to those three things, you'll get through those trials. Is this making sense? Okay. <clears throat> Question. How do we get through these trials? And how do we face these temptations? I gave you the sentence last week, but if you weren't here, I'll give it to you again. Trials and temptations are what? I cannot stress this enough, beloved. You and I have to go through trials in life. It's just the way it is. There's no way around it. You and I have and are and will go through trials in life. You all understand that? What it's inevitable. What, inevitable mean? what does inevitable mean? It's, gonna happen. It's, gonna happen. it's definitely going to happen. It has to happen, Charlotte. Charlotte. Violent, excuse me. It has to happen. We have to go through hard times in life. It, they have to happen, Violent. These things have to happen. But it's okay. Because God is in control. And if you love God, He's allowing these trials in your life and my life for our good. He's going to work something good out of it. God causes all things to work together for our good. So He's going to bring good out of this tapestry. At the time, we may not see it, but in the end, we will see it. Ah, oh, I see why I didn't go through that. So, trials and temptations are inevitable, and God intends both trials and temptations to deepen our faith, to mature us, to grow us up. By the way, the word trials, tempt, and tempted, all those words occur in the first chapter of James. And you know what's interesting about that? It's all the same Greek word. It's all the same Greek word. The Greek word is para. I underlined it for you. And that word para can be translated as either trial or temptation. Sometimes it's translated as trial. Sometimes it's translated as temptation. It's the same Greek word. How can you know when it's a trial or temptation? Well, the context, the context, the context. As you read the Bible, you read a lot about people who went through trials. You'll read about when you go through trials. It'll read about a lot of people who are tempted. It'll talk a lot about when you are tempted. Same, same Greek word. It's either a trial or a temptation, depending on the context. Pardon me. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. 
Sometimes we face trials on the outside, and sometimes we face temptations on the inside. That's a quick way, an easy way, a simplistic way. <coughs> trials come from the outside. Temptations come, and you have to deal with temptations on the inside. Does that make sense? A loved one gets sick. That happens outside. You lose your job. That happens outside. That's a trial in your life. But you're tempted to steal money that doesn't belong to you. You're tempted to, when you get depressed, take drugs, get drunk. You're tempted to have an affair with somebody <clears throat> that you're not married to. Those are temptations. You have to wrestle with those on the inside. Does that make sense? Same Greek word. Same Greek word. How we understand these trials or these temptations and how we respond to them has everything to do with our faith. That's why James is so big on faith and acting on our faith. Here's a big point. One day every person is going to stand before Almighty God. And God's goal from today, from right now, God's goal from now until then, until we stand before Him, is to prepare us for that day. He's getting us ready to stand in His presence. That's why He's not going to leave you or me as babies. He's not going to do it, people. He's going to mature us. He's getting us ready so that we can stand in His presence on that great day. Now, you and I, we don't think like this. Most think the goal of life is to be successful, or to have a nice job, or to get a raise, or to achieve something in the world, a standing in the world, or maybe to attain a specific goal, or to have a certain kind of family. You have your goals, I have my goals, we all have goals in life, yes? God wants us to understand that our goal in life has to be directed upward. But if, we, if our goal in life is to have a certain kind of family, have a certain amount of money, have a certain lifestyle, or whatever, then when trials hit in our family, or at work, or with some plans we have, those trials will devastate us. I was marching this way for this door, and boom, I got knocked. And now I can't find the door. It'll devastate you. If that's your goal, I feel sorry for you. I do, because guess what? God's going to make sure you understand that your goal in life can't be earthward. It just can't be. But if our goal is heavenward, ah, then these trials won't be so devastating. <laughs> then we can take joy in trials because we know that no matter how tough things are, they are moving us toward our goal, which is heavenward. Do you all get the point I'm making here? Hello? Yeah. Planet Earth calling? Yeah. Here's Romans 8.29. For whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. For whom God foreknew, he also predestined to become, what's that word underlined? conformed to the image of his son. Whether you like it or not, I'm going to use new truck here. Whether he likes it or not, God is moving Bob to become more like Jesus. That's what he's doing. Whether Mike likes it or not, God is maturing Mike and God is slowly making Mike more like Jesus. And he's doing the same for you and I. He wants us to be conformed to the image of his son. Do you all get that? Hello? Yes. Okay. 
In the 12th chapter, Paul wrote this in Romans. I gave you the positive that God is conforming us to the image of his son. That's the positive. Here Paul gives us the negative. Do not, do not be conformed to the world. And do not be conformed to this world. You and I are to be working with the Holy Spirit to be more and more like Jesus. God wants us to be more like his son Jesus, more loving and kind and patient and forgiving. More willing to help and not ignore. All the things that you could think of that Jesus is, that you've learned about the Lord Jesus, all of these things that God is slowly transforming you and I toward. But here Paul says, now on the other hand, here's a negative, do not be conformed to this world. Do not adopt this world's view of life. Do not adopt this world's view of morality or ethics. Because this world's view is headed for the fire. It's in opposition to God. So, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Allow yourself to be slowly transformed into the image of God's Son, Jesus. Is this making sense? Don't follow the path of the world. Allow God and His Holy Spirit to slowly change you to be more like Jesus. In order that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We are not to be conformed to the world. We're to allow ourselves to be transformed into the image of Jesus so we can know what God's will is for us. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. I want to finish today with a question for all of you. Truly, practical, real-world question right here. What is your real goal in life, people? Come on, don't, don't tell me. But I want you to sit here right now, and I want you to think about it. Up to this point, right now, each and every one of you, you have a goal in life. What is your real goal in life? What are you aiming for, really? <clears throat> Take just a second. Don't, I don't want anybody to shout it out or blur it out. But I'm telling you, we all have goals in life, do we not? Amen. Hello? Where's Bradley? Is Brad here? He's right there. Yeah, no. I'm not going to ask him, but the truth is, Brad has a goal or a bunch of goals in life. There you go. So do you. So I'm asking you now, right now, I want you to think about it. What is your real goal in life? Make enough money? How about just to get by another day? Some of us, if I could just pay my bills this week, if I could just get by today, whew, what a goal. But seriously, some of us have that as a goal, just to get by day by day by day. How about this one, to eat another meal? For those of us who are older, let me give you a little shocker. If you eat two or three meals a day, there are 365 days in a year, that means you eat somewhere north of a thousand meals in a year. If the average person lives 70 to 80 years, you're, you're going to eat 70 to 100,000 meals. Is your goal just to eat another meal? How many different meals can you eat? Hello? Is, is that your goal? Oh boy. I can't wait to get home and have another piece of pizza. <laughs> oh, wow. I've been thinking all morning, I'm going to tell Jody, we've got to stop by and get a chalupa from Taco Bell. Is that your goal in life? Just to get by one more day, just to eat one more meal? How about just to enjoy another pleasure? Now, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not trying to make you all Amish or Mennonite to deny all pleasures or 
300 year old Presbyterian. You know, we, we eschew, I love that word, we eschew all pleasures in this life, knowing that we shall attain to greater pleasures in the next. We don't smile, we don't joke, no, no, no. No levity allowed. I'm not, I'm not trying to tell anybody that they have to give up pleasures in life. I'm just saying the pleasures in life, if that's your goal, wow, you got your goal set way too low. And God's going to rip it away from you. If you're his son or daughter, he's going to rip it away from you because your eyes, your eyes cannot be here, people. Your eyes cannot be here. Your eyes have to be there. Amen. No, they do. They have to be heavenward. Or maybe you're going to just spend, again, more time with the family. Don't make that your goal in life. No. Less time with family. <laughs> hey, Grandma. Don't stop right. laughing. Hello. Doris. She started giggling when she heard that. And she was shaking her head in a hug. No, I'm serious. Some of you, yeah, the big thing in your life is your family. That's it. You know, it's all about the family. I feel sorry for you if that's your goal. I do. I do. I love my family. I love spending time with Jody and Cord. <laughs> and Carol Brown. I love my family, and you, I want you all to love your family, to give lots of hugs and kisses and everything. But I'm going to tell you the truth now. I'm old. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to pass it on to you. Members of my family are going to die. I'm going to die. That's the truth, people. And if my whole life is wrapped up in my wife, what's going to happen when she dies? Thank you, Barbara. I'm going to have a real hard time. Because my goal was to make my wife happy. And when she's no longer here, my whole life has just literally gone to hell in a handbasket, has it not? My goal is not just to make my wife happy. My goal has to be heavenward. And in the process of looking upward, if my father says, treat your wife right and do the right things and love your family members and do this, then I'm going to love my wife and do the right things and whatever. From the book of hesitations, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Do you all get the point I'm making here? If your goal is at this level or at this level, you got, you're, you're focusing on the wrong goal. Your goal must be here. Bring all of this good with you, but ain't be aiming for here. Does that make sense? If your goal is to have a nice, easy, carefree life, then trials, here it is again, then trials, which are inevitable, they will come. When these trials come, they will never be a joy to us. But if your goal is to know God, if your goal is to be conformed to His image, if your goal is to seek God, then we understand that trials in life are God's way of helping us to grow up, to mature, to become wise, Amen. helpful understanding to not only ourselves but to others. Is this making sense? Yeah. I hope so. So, I'll leave you with James. Blessed is the man who endures or perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, when he has stood the test of that trial, what? He will receive, what is that? The crown, the crown of life that God has promised to those who love Him. 
My Father is working me toward some great things. And I trust Him. And I trust Him absolutely. And on the surface, I'll be honest with you, on the surface, when I go through trials, I don't like them any more than you do. I don't. But, but James said, consider it joy. Because God is teaching me patience. God is teaching me endurance or perseverance. God is growing me up. He's giving me insight and wisdom. And I know at the end of every single trial, good's going to come out of it. And I'm old enough now to say I've gone through a lot of trials, and God's brought good out of it. He has. So, I hope you all got something out of today. Hello. Yes. Okay. James chapter 1. Read it, reread it, reread it. And next week we're going to go over what I told Violet. I'm going to talk more about wisdom. Okay, because we need wisdom in this world, do we not? What in the world is going on? We need His wisdom. We need His perspective to understand what's going on in the world. And then we, we can be at peace, you knowing that no matter what happens, it's all right. It doesn't matter what's happening in the world. I'll put it to you this way. It doesn't matter what's happening in the world. I'm in the ark. When the rains come, I'm in the ark. Are you in the ark? Well, then you can relax. You can hear the storm. You can hear the thunder. You can hear the pitter-patter. But it's okay, because you're in the ark. See, that's wisdom. Yes? yes. Okay, stand up. James really is a very, very deep, mature book. As I told Patty this morning, if you go to Texas Roadhouse and you order a big steak, when it comes, you don't jab your fork into the steak and just start gnawing on it. What do you do? You cut it into little bites and you take a chunk at a time. The book James is a porterhouse steak. You need to cut it in small sections. Take a little section and chew on it a while and think about it. And be asking God for wisdom. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come before your throne. Lord, I want to lift up all my brothers and sisters that are here this morning and all those who are watching my video. Father God, please, continue to bless your sons and daughters. Continue to watch over us. To continue to keep us as the apple of your eye. But Lord, give us wisdom when you take us through trials and help us to become the mature, kind, wise children that can be a benefit not only to the kingdom but to others. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.